Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sporting Max. Well, today we're joined by Australian Open star Tess Madgen. Welcome to the podcast, Tess. It's an absolute honour to have you on. How are you going at the moment? I'm very good, Max. Thank you so much for having me on. No worries. I'd like to start off with what was sort of growing up like for you? Yeah, it was obviously very competitive growing up with um, two brothers that also play elite sport now. Um, you know, we had a lot of tussles in the backyard. Um, yeah, it was highly competitive environment, which I think really of us, you know, become the athletes and people that we are today. So where did you sort of grow up? And, um, you know, I believe you played junior basketball for the Eastern Mavericks. Can you expand on sort of grow, um, where you grew up and your junior basketball years? Yeah, I grew up in the Barossa Valley in a little town called Williamstown. Um, and the closest club to us was the Eastern Mavericks or the North Adelaide Rockets. Um, and my parents really liked the Eastern Mavericks. They had a really country family feel about it. Um, and they were very flexible, you know, with training, having yeah. um, three of us playing basketball. And then my older sister also played netball and softball uh, for the state as well. So our parents were always, you know, in the car all weekend, every weekend. Um, and I guess I just grew up around sport and, you know, pretty competitive sport. And I think that definitely helped, um, you know, some people would say I'm a, a smart basketballer. So I think it definitely helped yeah. being a or just high level sport from a young age. Now you've competed um, in various Australian and national championships uh, for South Australia country. How did you find these experiences of playing in these events? Yeah, I love them. I loved playing for SA country. My favorite tournament growing up was the Albury Country Cup. I have a lot of fond memories from that. And um, I should have said before, actually, I played with Kayla George growing up um, and now a teammate of the Boomers and the Opals. We were both Eastern Mavericks juniors. Um, yeah, it was amazing, those SA country trips. Um, finally won a gold medal at under 20 nationals um, when the SA Metro and SA country combined. Um, you know, it was always really hard beating the Victorians, but finally got over the line um, with that. And I think just being around those tournaments and um, being exposed to other really great athletes from around Australia uh, really helped my game and helped show me what I need to work on to get better and, you know, really make the elite level. How did it feel to get a win over the VIX? Yeah, it was amazing. I think we had a record winning um, win in the gold medal match. Mm -hmm. And then the next year um, we played Victoria again in that same game and they beat us by more than we beat them <laughs> here before. So I had both ends of it, which was unfortunate. But um, yeah, that team we played had like Liz Cambage, Alice Kunek, Rachel Jerry. Um, yeah, they were just stacked. Um, yeah. Throughout 08 and 09, you had a scholarship um, with the AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport. How did you earn that scholarship and how did that opportunity at the AIS come about? Yeah, I think it definitely helped performing well at the um, Australian Junior National Championships. Um, obviously, Basketball Australia has a very good, you know, grasp of the talent coming through in the younger ranks and they keep an eye on, you know, all the prospects. Um, but yeah, I just, it was always a goal of mine after my first Australian Junior Championships to go to a Nationals. Um, and so I tried really hard. I improved my game a lot, it was always outside practicing on the on the Asheville court at home um and then yeah as soon as the opportunity came up I said absolutely um and so I did year 12 in Canberra which was really hard um being away from my family I didn't actually realize how hard it was going to be you know being away from mum and dad and my brothers and sisters but stepped into an immediate family with the girls and my teammates um there and you know I'm still best friends with some of those people I went to the AAS with today at the Oceana World Qualification Series, I see you made your international debut there. What does it mean to you to represent your country? Oh, it's everything. I mean, it's why we play the game. It's the best quality of basketball that you can play with the best people. Sorry, that's my dogs. Um, <laughs> and against the best people. Um, so, you know, it's what I trained for when I was little, you know, a young girl to hopefully one day pull on the green and gold and um, still haven't quite got my goal of making an Olympic team, hopefully this year, but 
that's the number one goal and that's I guess what I've been training for for since a very young age. In the 08 and 08, 09 and 09, 2012 um, WNBL season, you played with the AIS. Can you take me through these years, um, I guess, from your perspective? Sorry, Max. I'm just going to put my little dog on the ground because he's <laughs> What breed have you got? So, French Bulldogs. Nice. And they are going at it. Kobe, stop. Um, sorry. Yeah, so that was amazing to be able to play, you know, at such a young age and in the WNBL. I think that definitely helped a lot of us, you know, show us what we need to do to be able to compete at that level. And it's an opportunity I'm very grateful for. They don't get to do it anymore. Um, yeah. But it definitely helped, you know, show us how physical the game was, how much smarter we had to be, how much better skilled we had to be. And just that exposure um, of playing in the league. So when it was our turn to come out of the AIS, I feel like we were really ready to go and make an impact. And I think that can be seen from a lot of players that came out and went straight into the WNBO and, you know, had a significant impact on the league. So what were your stats sort of like throughout those years um, playing in the WNBO with the AIS? I couldn't tell you my exact stats, but... Um, I guess when you're at the AAS, everyone's kind of around the same level. So the ball's really shared a lot. Um, all the offences give everyone an opportunity to score, which is how it should be, you know, as you're growing up and learning the game and um, developing your skills. Yeah. So I couldn't tell you my exact stats, but I played with um, Steph Blitzarf. She was awesome. Uh, Liz Cambage, Alice Kunek, Rachel Jarry, Kate Gaze. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some real, some real Ripper players, but... Um, you know, and I'm friends with all those girls today. And I think that's what I love most about basketball is, you know, the friendships and relationships that are formed. And, um, you know, I'm still best friends with a lot of them today. What was that like to play with Liz Cambage? Yeah, she's amazing to play with. I've known Liz since we did our first Australian junior camp together. I was probably yeah. 15 and she was 14 or 13 <laughs> um, so I've known her for a very long time but she's amazing to play with um, obviously such a huge target she can do everything um, as a guard you know it's really a guard stream to have someone to feed who's that talented um, and you know she's a lot of fun off the court as well so have a lot of fun memories with Liz. After those years um, at the AIS you joined the Bendigo Spirit can you elaborate um, on your time at the, at the Spirit and what that meant to you? Yeah, it was amazing to come out of the AAS and go to the Spirit and be able to play with someone like Christy Harrow, who is, in my opinion, the best point guard I've ever played with. Amazing. Um, just reads the game so well. She made my life as a rookie so easy. She made, I reckon she made me look a lot better than what I was. Um, <laughs> But I was also really lucky that I got to play a lot. Um, I won most valuable player first season in the league out of the AIS. Um, and, you know, I think I, I tried to choose a team with the help of Phil Brown, the AIS coach, a team where I would be able to play and have a significant role. And it just worked out really well for me going to there. Just three weeks um, into your first season with Bendigo, you scored 28 points, going 75% from the field. <laughs> First of all, do you remember that game and what was that game like? Was that against Adelaide Lightning? I think so. Yeah, I, it was um, in Gawler, I think, which is like 20 minutes from my family home. So it felt like a, a home court for me, I suppose. But <laughs> um, I wish I could score 28 points at 75% again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I've done that for a while. Um, no, yeah, I definitely do remember that game and just everything. Sometimes you have those games where every time you shoot it, you just feel like it's going in. And, um, yeah, that was one of those games. But like I said before, Christy and the rest of my teammates at the Spirit, I was the youngest by a mile and they made my job really easy and, you know, made, I think made me look better than what I actually was. Now, named to the Opal side under 2011, how did it make you feel to be recognised as one of the best players in the country? And what emotions do you remember um, being processed through your body um, when you found out that you were sort of selected and announced in the rooms in the Oval side? Sorry. Yeah, that was amazing. I, I was very shocked, um, you know, to be selected at such a young age. But I suppose I did have a really good WNBL season and I probably deserved to make it, but it was still a shock. Um 
And then just going to that first camp, I was so nervous. And again, I try and take everything as an opportunity. So it really showed me what I need to work on and um, the physicality and the skill that I needed to get better at in order to compete at that level at those camps. In 2012, you signed with the Melbourne Boomers. Can you expand on the process of being signed by Melbourne? Yeah, so after a couple of years with the Spirit, I really, I guess, wanted to expand my game and get better um, with my individual skills. And, you know, the opportunity came up to be coached by Tom Ma, arguably the best coach Australia's ever had. Yep. Um, and Michelle Timms was an assistant and Gary Fox. So three really elite coaches. And I just, you know, grabbed the opportunity and I feel like it paid dividends with Tom Ma, Timsey and Gary, but then... Who was to come was Guy Malloy, who's probably had the biggest influence on my career as a coach um, in terms of, you know, the style of play I play, all the skills, how I score. Um, I think he's had the main impact as a coach on, on my skill set. So absolutely no regrets with my move to Melbourne. Um, I still actually live in Melbourne now. So yeah. I love Melbourne. I love the city. Um, it feels like home to me for sure. What's that like for you to surround yourself I'm with superstar players and superstar coaches. Yeah, it's, you know, the, we're very lucky in Australia that, you know, every team is really stacked with talented players. Um, Australia, especially female basketball, as we produce really great ones. So yeah. to be able to be surrounded with them and play with them every day and then, you know, every WNBL team has a, has a great coach. So I think you'd be blessed wherever you go. But I just think... Um, the relationship Guy and I have as player, as coach is definitely um, one that I, I thrive under. What was your time um, at the Melbourne Boomers like for you up until um, 2016? Yeah, it was really good. Um, I did get injured in that last year. I rolled my ankle quite badly. But up until then, I, you know, I had a really good time. We came, um, I made the WNBA in my time with the Boomers. Um, you know, I always had a really significant role and I, I really relished that. And yeah, I just loved it. I love what the club is about. It's still a very family orientated, community based club. Um, and I really love that. And I feel like, you know, when you care about your players as people and not just as players, you really get the best out of them. And the boomers definitely do that. And I think that, you know, begins with Guy as a coach. He's, he cares so much about his players and you just want to play play for him and play really hard for him um, week in and week out. So it's a huge credit to the club um, and a huge credit to him as a coach. Like you just mentioned before, um, you had sort of a, w, a goal in the uh, go in the WNBA um, throughout your time with the Boomers. Um, that was sort of obviously at the Phoenix Mercury. What's that WNBA culture and experience like? Great question, Max. It's really like nothing, you know, you've ever experienced before. Um it's it's everything like that you want to you want in an um in a league it's so competitive everyone's elite you know it's the best yeah. 144 best. players in the whole world um so it was really hard i i found it quite challenging um in terms of just going out there and just like taking the ball by the horns i guess i'm quite a i try and be a team orientated player in the WNBA, you know, you just got to take what's given. Yeah. So it was amazing, an amazing experience. You rock up to work at eight and then you leave at three, like, you know, how it should be in Australia or for all female leagues around the world. So it's definitely the most professional, well-run, um, best league in the world, hands down. After taking on the um, WNBA, I believe you headed to Poland. What about Poland? Um, intrigued you to want to go to Europe and play overseas? Um, I really, what as a, a goal of mine for my career was to play in the WNBA, WNBL and for Australia um, and in Europe. So that was always a goal of mine. Um, and as I guess I got better in the WNBL, um, it was time for me to go and really I had a good skill set. Um, and I guess it was time for me to, you know, take on the world as you will. And I didn't really care where I went in Europe, but um, 
Poland really intrigued me as a as a country. I hadn't I hadn't been to Eastern Europe and yeah. I do really like to, you know, travel the world and um, I'd been to Western Europe a lot. So that intrigued me as a place. Um, but also my coach was an assistant coach for Belinda Snell yeah. um, when she played in Poland. And so she had really good things to say about him. And um, that also helped, you know, you're going into an unfamiliar situation. If, you know, if someone who you really respect and look up to saying the coach is pretty good, then it made me feel com confident and comfortable to go there. What was it like to travel Europe um, a bit and experience a foreign country? Yeah, that was amazing. Um, really thankful for basketball to being allowed, you know, being able to do that. I think I've travelled to over 30 countries just playing basketball, which is amazing. But <laughs> Poland was, I loved my time there. Um, the people are super friendly. It's super cheap. Um, the only thing, I hadn't seen snow ever in my life. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, the girls said it had only snowed for five days the previous year. So don't get my hopes up too much. <laughs> and then it snowed and I cried because I was so happy to see the snow. And um, it did not stop snowing, Max, for five months. <laughs> and so then I was crying because I just wanted it to stop. <laughs> um, the, the days are short. It's very cold. Um, but, yeah, it was an amazing experience um, to, to live in such a different culture than what we have in Australia. I hear you suffered a knee injury um, while in Poland. What happened here and how did you find rehab? Yeah, I did my ACL. We were playing the top team. So the top eight teams make the playoffs in um, Poland and we finished eighth. So we're playing the first team um, and we were winning. It's the best of five games. And we were winning by 10 with about three minutes to go. And there was no way I was losing that game. So I got the ball. It was a low shot clock. I just drove in and got a tiny bump like you would, it would happen a million times a game. Yep. Um, and I just landed really awkwardly and straight away I knew I'd done my ACL. So I was distraught. I was in pain, but it was more the fact that I knew I had done it. And so I just took me ages to get off the court and I was in so much pain. And um, then the next day I went and saw a doctor and they said, yeah, I'd done my ACL. Um, so I flew straight home to Melbourne uh, to have surgery on it. Um, rehabbed it for the whole year and when I was out with my knee I also got my ankle reconstructed because um, wow. I had done that quite badly with the boomers so I was rehabbing two injuries which was very hard um, but in that time I finished my first university degree so I really just tried to focus on other things and um, you know I got to spend a lot more time with my family which I had been missing for a long time so you know, every cloud has a silver lining and I just tried to use the opportunity to get really fit uh, physically and mentally because I was quite drained from basketball at this time. I'd missed um, the 2016 Olympics. Um, and so I just used it to refresh mentally and physically and it's held me in good stead in the back end of my career um, in both of those regards. So... I came back with such a newfound love for basketball and um, made that 2018 World Cup team, I think, just because I was just so happy playing the game and I was playing so good. Um, so, you know, every cloud has a silver lining and who knows if I would have made that team if I if I had never done my ACL. You hear about sort of things in sports um, when people um, sort of do their ACL and then they have to sort of travel home and then get surgery. What's that like to travel while you've got an injury and then, like, it's not going from, right, you've done the injury one day, the next day you go on a surgery. It's, like, maybe a couple of days or a week or something like that in between the injury and the surgery. That's a very good question. Um, it was really hard to get uh, from Poland to Australia with one leg. Um, I utilised, like, the wheelchair access and stuff in the airport because – you know, those international airports are massive and there's no way I could have walked Absolutely. through them. Um, but everyone's um, ACL injuries are different. Like some people have no pain. I had quite significant pain. I had really bad bone bruising. Um, so, yeah, it was really hard. But in terms of when the surgery is, they do try and advise you to have it pretty quick. But you can do a lot of rehab to strengthen up all the muscles around it before you go in. So... That was another major concern to me, but 
Um, you know, luckily I got in, I think it was like less than two weeks after I had ruptured my ACL mm -hmm. from another country. So I got pretty looked after, which was, which was amazing. You mentioned before um, playing some great basketball and making that um, 2018 FIBA World Cup in Spain. Now you won a silver medal in that World Cup. First of all, how was that tournament? And secondly, can you take me through the final match where you won the silver medal, but unfortunately just couldn't get the gold? Yeah, absolutely. So that's the best tournament I've ever been a part of, the best team I've ever been a part of, for sure. The, you know, the team camaraderie and how we all just played for each other and played for Sandy and just really played for Australia, the green and gold on our uniforms. And I had so much fun, as did all the girls at that tournament. Um, I think the, the best game for sure was beating Spain in, you know, 16,000 people in that stadium. My ears still rang at 2.30 in the morning. Like I just could not sleep. I <laughs> um, can still hear all the fans and just like the spectacle, how well Liz played in that, in that second half and Kayla hitting that massive three and just everyone really doing their roles. Um, it was an amazing team to be a part of. But yeah, I think that um, crossover match to make the gold medal game really took a lot out of everyone. Um, and unfortunately, we just didn't really quite bring our A game um, to the grand final. But I think that'll hold us in really good stead for the Olympics. You know, we've had that experience. I think the team, yeah. um, you know, has a, has a core group. And I think, you know, we'll, we will be better off for it come, come the Olympics. You returned back to the WNBL uh, at the Townsville Fire in 2018. Now, let me know if I got my homework correct, but I'm sure you played um, in that championship with the Fire. Uh, can you take me through um, that championship series? I actually missed out on the championship series. Yep. That was a year before I got there. Yep. Well, so what, what was that like going into sort of a winning mentality environment? Yeah, it was amazing. That was one of the main reasons I signed there was because... Um, you know, I really wanted to play with Susie, um, one of the best players in the in the world. Um, and I just heard it had such a great culture. Um, and that was something that was something I really wanted to be a part of. So going into that, um, yeah, it was great. It was, you know, what I hoped it would be. Unfortunately, Susie had an injury and had to miss quite a significant part of the season. Um, mm -hmm. So that that wasn't ideal, but just the whole community really gets around the fire. There's um, the Cowboys, the rugby team, and then us as the as the two elite sports teams. So really, really great community support. Um, yeah, and I love my time in Townsville. You made your way back to your old site um, in the Melbourne Boomers. Why did you decide to return to Melbourne and how did it feel to be back in Perth on the Gold? Um, I really wanted to play for Guy again and um, be back in that, you know, I, I love Melbourne, so I wanted to live here in the city. Um, and I loved the club and I felt like I played my best basketball in Melbourne. So I kind of wanted to get back to that yep. um, and just, you know, really enjoy my last years that I still play. So I guess that's what brought me back and, um, you know, absolutely no regrets. I The hub season was really tough, but I really loved it. and. Um, I love my team. It, it was had the same feel as the Opals team, really. Um, mm -hmm. Very good cohesion. Everyone had each other's backs. Um, yeah, yeah. It was it was great to be a part of. I see you've done some training um, at Hoop City in preparation for the 2021 Olympics. What's it like to train at Hoop City? Um, can you expand on some of the drills or exercises that you do to prepare for this 2021 Tokyo Olympics? Yeah, great question. So for me, a lot of my training is done off the basketball court. So keeping my body um, fit and strong. So heaps of cardio and a lot of weights and Pilates. Um, but Hoop City, what an amazing facility they have down there. I'm very grateful to be able to have, to be able to use it. And then when the Opals go into practice, we do, uh, we scrimmage against guys. Mm -hmm. So wow. I think we're such, you know, such a good team because, we know how to play well together. And the only way to do that is to actually play together. So we have a lot of girls based in Melbourne, which is amazing. And we can, you know, scrimmage five on five um, and get through our sets and get some cohesion together. And then um, we just do a lot of shooting drills that we'll get out of the offense. So um, 
practicing like game specific shots is something I'm huge on. And when you only have a small time on the court every week, um, you've got to practice what, you know, what's going to benefit you. And I think getting those game specific shots out of the offense is really, really beneficial. How do you prepare physically and also mentally um, for this Olympics? Um, well, I'm doing everything I can at the moment to try and make the team. Um, but mentally, I do a lot of visualization. I see sports psychologists, um, you know, to stay fresh mentally. Uh, I practice a lot of mindfulness. Um, as you can see, my dogs have been annoying me. So, you know, <laughs> if I've had, if I haven't had a good game or a rough training, um, they're amazing to come home to, take them for a walk. Um, you know, they're, they're like my best friends, these little two, even though they annoy me so much. Um, and physically, like I said before, like a lot of Pilates, weights. weights. Um, yeah. yeah, keeping my keeping my body as fit and as strong as I can. So when I do get on the court, you know, I'm not breaking down with an injury or um, and I'm strong and powerful and ready to go. But I love my favourite training is um, individual skill sessions. So yeah. even though I'm getting older, I'm 30 now, I'm still always trying to add stuff to my game and learn new stuff and mm -hmm different type of ways to score. And I've signed with the Bendigo Braves in the NBL one. And my coach, Mark Halabakov does some amazing stuff. Like he is very well researched in individual skills and he does a lot of stuff that NBA players are doing. So the other day I went to practice and he had a full Tyler Harrow workout for me. And wow. yeah, I love Tyler Harrow. So I was pretty stoked. So just continuing to try and find people and, um, and environments where I can continue to grow as a player and as a person. Um, I always try and put myself in situations for that to happen. So just on, like you mentioned, training and then games, what does your weekly schedule look like? Yep. So I am do at least two or three trainings a day. Um, so today I went and shot in the morning and then I went to Pilates after that. And then I had team practice tonight. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow's a little bit of a lighter day being Wednesday. So I have just weights in the morning and an individual session after that. Yep. Um, and then on Thursday, I have training with the Opals um, and then I'll do Pilates after that. And then uh, yesterday I had cardio weights and shooting. Mm -hmm. So at the moment I'm training a lot um, just leading up into camp. And then um, after that, it'll probably go back to a bit more of a normal week. How do you feel, um, I guess, about playing in the Olympics? I mean, it would be an absolute dream come true. So the, t the squad is very talented. So it's going to be a very hard team to make. But, you know, if I was to make it like everyone else on the squad, it is a dream come true. And just to be able to represent Australia at the pinnacle of sports um, for the whole world would be amazing. And um, we have a team that can win a gold medal. So that's even more exciting. Yeah. Um, and just to be in that environment and competing with the best people against the best people, you know, is what we all thrive on. So I think that's what excites me the most about it. What's it like for you to go out there um, on a day-to-day -day basis and burst the best basketballers in the world? Yeah, it's great. Like, especially with the Opals practices, um, you know, we have some of the best players in the world in Melbourne. Uh, six of Six of the Opals squad went to WNBA this week or last week. So it just wow. proves, um, and Liz How was already over there. So I think we've got seven. Yeah, just so much talent. Um, and it is like playing with Ezzy, I should have said before in the WNBL season, um, Ezzy and Kayla, you know, it, it was a dream. And Ezzy's so talented and just really hasn't even hit, you know, half of her potential, I don't think. She's yeah. going to be an incredible player. She already is one, but... Playing with her is super exciting as well. So Australia is in very good hands with basketball um, and, you know, exciting times ahead. Who do you think is the best athlete in your family? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, in terms of athleticism, I think Ben probably was. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, I don't know, out of Jack and I, but I'm going to say who's, Jack's who's, definitely who's the, the most shooter. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> now, what like, AFL, AFL team do you support? Oh, Collingwood. I didn't used to. I used to support Richmond, but since Jack's been playing for Collingwood, definitely yeah. Collingwood. Yeah. 
Who did you idolize growing up? Uh, Penny Taylor. Um, and Rachel Swan. Sorry. If you didn't play basketball, um, what would you do? Um, I'm starting to be a PE teacher, so I would say that, or a Pilates instructor. Can you tell me about like studying to be a PE teacher and what that sort of course entitles? Yep. So we, I did a Bachelor of Exercise Sports Science and now I'm doing a Master's of Teaching. So the teaching Master's is very hands-on, a lot of placements. You go out to schools and you learn on the job, really. Um, so, yeah, it's really good. And then quite a few assignments as well. So trying to juggle study and playing basketball um, can be hard at times, but definitely gives me an outlet um, and gives me something else to try and be you know, good at. So I yeah. think that's very healthy, a healthy balance. If you could go out for dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Uh, LeBron James, oh, just because I love him so much. Um, where do you keep your tomato sauce in the fridge or in the cupboard? Fridge. Um, now we've seen we've seen your dogs um, sort of in the background and front and centre. What are their two names and what breeds are they? Um, they're actually named after basketballers. So we have Kobe. Oh, Ray, nice. Kobe. He's asleep. Um, and then we have Bronny, named yeah. after the goat. Yep. <laughs> down here, um, sleeping. As well, and they're French bulldogs. Yeah. What would be your advice for any young basketballers who want to take their game to the next level and be a successful basketballer for Australia and the Opals like yourself? Great question. I think believe in yourself because not at all times, not everyone will believe in you, but as long as you believe in yourself, you'll create that for others to believe in you and have an open mind and keep putting yourselves in opportunities to get better. Thanks Tess for coming on the podcast and putting aside um, half an hour or so of your time to come on and have a chat. It's been an absolute honor for you to have uh, for you to come on and good luck uh, with sort of the Braves and the Olympics. Thank you, Max. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Tess. Stay tuned, everyone, for some more Sporting Max.